Bitcoin. Bitcoin? Bitcoin. What exactly am Bitcoin? Is it just Disney bucks for dorks and drug dealers? Or is it something more? Can Bitcoin make you rich? And how the hell do I get them out of my computer? <laughs> to answer all these questions, I want to tell you a story. It's a story about Bitcoin's journey from being a libertarian stink dream to a global financial phenomenon. It's the story of two men, Mark Carpellis and Ross Ulbricht, two pioneering Bitcoiners who will never meet, but together they made history, headlines, billions of dollars, and eventually gallons of prison toilet wine, also known as Pruno. But before we get to them, we have to start at the beginning. Bitcoin is a decentralized digital currency or a cryptocurrency. But what makes Bitcoin more than just make-believe monopoly money is that every Bitcoin transaction is theoretically anonymous. And yet, all of these transactions are recorded for anyone to see and verify on a peer-to-peer -peer ledger system known as the blockchain. Now, if all those mouth sounds don't make sense to your skull-trapped thought sponge, don't panic because it's not important. But what is important is understanding who this technology excites. Bitcoin appeals to three core groups of people. There's the libertarian nerds who see the currency's decentralized technology as the key to taking monetary power away from the world's governments. Then there are the get-rich-quick Kool-Aid-drinking schemers who see Bitcoin's popularity as a way to make a fast bit or buck. And finally, there's the humble, screen-bound stoner who likes to buy drugs with his keyboard rather than meeting a smelly teenager on a street corner. There is, of course, some overlap between these groups, so I've arranged them in this convenient and easy-to-understand Venn diagram. Shit. But the people who got to this circle jerk early covered themselves and each other in hot steaming globs of cash. And that's where our story begins. It's 2010. The world is still recovering from the global financial fuckity doodah. Everyone's favorite toilet time activity is flicking ill-tempered birds at cartoon pigs, and when they're not doing that, they're getting down to the timeless uncle-nephew grooves of LMAFO. Bitcoin has been around for about two years and no one knows it exists other than a gaggle of hunchback screen shaggers. And the only way to get Bitcoin is to mine it yourself, which you do by making your computer solve a series of extremely complex computational math problems. So people needed a way to get their grubby hands on Bitcoin without turning their computer into a glorified egg fryer. They needed a Bitcoin exchange. This is Mark Carpenter. Pelles. He's a portly French software developer living in Tokyo, and he loves nothing more than anime, bento boxes, and Bitcoin. He reads about a startup called Mt. Gox, the first official Bitcoin exchange run by a guy called Jed McCaleb. It's in its infancy, but the very existence of this exchange sends the price of Bitcoin skyrocketing 900% from $0.008 to a whopping 8 cents. Shit just got real. Mark smells an opportunity. He offers to buy the exchange outright, despite having no experience in finance or as a CEO. Regardless, he takes over in early 2011. But he's not the only one who noticed Mt. Gox's potential. Hackers, and lots of them, see the exchange as a cyber piggy bank hankering for a hammering. Before Mark is even able to take over, one hacker makes off with over 80,000 bitcoins. And by that time, bitcoin had just about reached parity with the dollar. The exchange is already insolvent, and the holes in its security are more alarming than the ones drilled into the wall of a truck stop toilet stall. Anyone else would have realized that they'd just boarded and became captain of a sinking ship. Especially considering the currency that it's selling can't buy anything in the real world. But that's about to change. Somewhere in a cabin just outside Barstrop, Texas, a failed research scientist is nurturing a dream. A dream and several kilograms of psychedelic mushrooms. His name is Ross Albrecht. He's 27 years old and he feels like a failure. Disconnected from the world, he writes this in his sporadically kept diary. I had mostly shut myself off from people because I felt ashamed of where my life was. I had left my promising career as a scientist to be an investment advisor and entrepreneur and came up empty-handed. 
But for the last few months, Ross has been working tirelessly on a side hustle. A dark web marketplace where anyone can buy anything, but mostly high quality narcotics. And the only currency it accepts is Bitcoin. He launches the site in February and promotes it in forums across the normie net. It doesn't take long before buyers and sellers arrive in droves. Ross is in business, but the site keeps him busy. He processes every transaction himself and has to rewrite the entire website to plug its many security holes. But it's worth it because this Texas shroom slinger is an idealist. He believes vehemently that everyone should be able to buy and sell what they want without the government's interference. But again, he is mostly selling drugs. Back to Tokyo, it's May 2011, and Mt. Gox is still getting hacked up more times than Ed Gein's furniture friends. This would be a challenge for anyone, and it doesn't help that Mark is really bad at his job. The few employees that he does hire say he's distracted and basically disinterested in the day-to-day -day workings of an office. And one particularly determined hacker is able to get his hands deep inside Mark's hot wallet. Not his butt. A hot wallet is where bitcoins are stored after a transaction, but because a hot wallet has to be online, it's always vulnerable to hackers. To protect themselves, Mark and his staff eventually set up a series of cold wallets, offline sites that can only be accessed physically. Great idea! Except that it's not, because to ensure the continued security of these cold wallets, Nobody can access them, so you never know exactly how much money you've got in those storage units. And to be able to put the coins in the cold storage in the first place, they still have to travel through the initial hot wallet. And the hacker that first blew Mt. Gox's back doors in sets himself up with permanent access to it. Meaning that this hacker was elbow deep in Mark's greasy ham wallet for the rest of Mt. Gox's existence, siphoning a total of 650,000 bitcoins out of the exchange. Meanwhile, the Silk Road had truly set sail. Every drug fiend with a broadband connection now had access to more narcotic variety than you could shake a crack pipe at. Hello, weary traveller! Welcome to the Silk Road, where you can get every drug under the sun, under your nose, in two to three working days. Maybe I can interest you in 10 grams of high-quality MDMA, with an advertised purity of 80%. What's in the other 20? Don't worry about it. Or how about 3.5 grams of Mexican black tar heroin? Spicy! We've also got more prescription drugs than an Alabama trailer park. We've got Oxys, we've got Zan, we've got Tramadol. I don't know what that one is, but I've heard it's good. Or maybe you're feeling adventurous, in which case let me recommend one gram of Freebase DMT. You might see God, you might not, but at least you'll have something to talk to Joe Rogan about. And of course, we've got good old-fashioned crystal meth, also known as ice, crank, or Australian icing sugar. Who needs teeth when you've got bargains like these? Thanks to Bitcoin and a growing team of admins, Ross is doing something unprecedented. The centralized payment system of the Silk Road instills a great deal of trust in it early on. And because of the customer review section, people know they aren't just exchanging their Bitcoins for bags of oregano. They get so confident that they even start running dark web commercials. But inevitably, all this success draws some unwanted attention. LSD, cocaine, and ecstasy are now just a click of a mouse away. A new website sells illegal drugs to anyone who is willing to pay. In June 2011, Gorka, the website that nobody misses, publishes this long-form stink piece. And after this, putting it mildly, shit went bananas. The regular web is suddenly set on fire with shock, condemnation, disgust, and people googling the phrase, where the hell do I buy me some online drug tokens? The answer being, Mt. Gox. At its peak, Mt. Gox was processing 70% of the world's Bitcoin, amounting to around $15 million a day. And at least one third of all the coins going through Mt. Gox were heading straight up the Silk Road. Mark had bought a company that he didn't build 
and was benefiting from a boom that he didn't create. Regardless, he was riding higher than all of his customers combined. He buys a luxury high-rise apartment in Tokyo's Shibuya Ward, despite the fact that his company is still insolvent. The price of Bitcoin reaches a historic high, basically functioning as stock in the online black market. It supercharges Mark's business, but also his debt, multiplying it by a factor of about 30. Attempting to make his site more secure, Mark institutes a new wallet system, but the code he writes it with is garbage. There was a bug in his code that sent thousands of Bitcoins to unspendable addresses, which is the equivalent of throwing a load of cash into a volcano. But other than that cluster fucky mistakey poo, the wallet system is actually pretty good, and then from this point on, there are no more hacks of the Mt. Gox system. Under America's now septumless nose, the US postal system has been converted into the most efficient narcotics delivery system in the world. Chuck Schumer, Democratic senator and half-inflated beach ball left in a Venice Beach trash can, condemns Bitcoin and the Silk Road on the Senate floor. The FBI and the Department of Homeland Security both set up a dedicated task force to infiltrate Silk Road, and all this attention terrified Ross Ulbricht. I was mentally taxed, and now I felt extremely vulnerable and scared. The US government, my main enemy, was aware of me, and some of its members were calling for my destruction. Quick side note, if you're going to be committing a lot of crimes, best not keep a journal. It's either the journaling or the crimes. You can't do both. But there was something else brewing inside Ross Ulbricht, something stronger than fear or pride. Ego. I imagine that someday I may have a story written about my life, and it would be good to have a detailed account of it. He believes the world needs to feast on the wine of his mind grapes. With this inflated sense of self and the encouragement of his crew of administrators, Ross takes on an alias, the Dread Pirate Roberts. A reference to the character from the film The Princess Bride, where the title is passed from person to person, cleverly suggesting that there is a team of people behind the Silk Road. A smart tactic that Ross immediately begins undermining by posting long, personal, rambling messages to the Silk Road homepage. Yar, There are heroes among us here at the Silk Road. Every day they risk their lives and fortunes and precious liberty for us. Silk Road is an enterprise that is just getting started. It could literally change the world as we know it. Yar. Silk Road needs our support. Do it for me. Do it for yourselves. Do it for your families and friends. And do it for mankind. Yar. <laughs> Needless to say, Ross was getting high on his own supply. And to be fair, I could understand why. By 2013, the Silk Road had over 1 million active users and was turning over billions in transactions. Just imagine what it's like to get the highest high score of all time and not be able to tell anyone. He was ready to burst like a condom full of heroin in a drug mule's ham wallet. And Ross wasn't the only one luxuriating in his success. Back in Japan, Mark was taking interviews from the bouncy throne of his exercise ball, balanced precariously on a mountain of debt and other people's money. Every venture capitalist vulture and hedge fund fuckboy was buying their Bitcoin from Mt. Gox. And people were making mini fortunes just from trading Bitcoin. Trying to balance his books, Mark begins trading on his own exchange by using a bot to artificially inflate the price. That's fraud. Or it would have been if the bot actually worked. Its job was to retrieve the Bitcoin lost in the initial hacks, but it worked so poorly that later calculations suggested that it lost the exchange a further $65 million. On top of that, an additional 200,000 Bitcoins just went missing. No explanation, apparently these Bitcoins just slipped between the cracks of the system's cyber sofa cushions. I know I've been spewing more figures than a Sesame Street vampire, but remember those 200,000 bitcoins because they'll be important later. The real banks also begin to put pressure on Mt. Gox, only allowing it to transfer a few million dollars a day, substantially slowing down the operation. Which isn't helped because bitcoin is going from strength to strength. In March 2013, a financial crisis in Cyprus leads to a run on the banks 
and Bitcoin as people fear the collapse of the euro. Overnight, the price of Bitcoin spikes to $160. Every butt coiner in the world, whether they were treating it as an investment opportunity or not, just saw their investment balloon like some kind of soapy sphere. Just as Mark thinks this supercharged market price can save his exchange, he's raided again. Not by hackers, but by the US government. Under hastily written new legislation, the US government grants itself the power to seize everyone's Bitcoin, taking $5 million worth from the exchange. And with that access, they get a better understanding of where all that Bitcoin is going. The feds track down one of the Silk Road's actual servers to a farm in Iceland. This physical piece of the Silk Road allows the feds to figure out the last place that Ross had accessed the website's VPN a small French cafe on Sacramento Street, San Francisco. After a few weeks holiday in Australia, Ross moved to San Francisco, living as a lodger in a flat share with strangers. Then things start to unravel. In Utah of all places, home to Mormons, meth, and Curtis Green. The father of two has been making hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin, working as a salaried administrator at the Silk Road. But he's also a customer. Just as he orders one kilogram of Bolivian shouting powder to his front door, it's followed by two federal agents. Caught white-handed, he hands over hundreds of vendor passwords, and with it, the credentials of many of the Silk Road's major dealers. When Ross finds out that one of his admins have been caught, he's terrified. Lucky for Ross, another admin has a solution. Have Curtis killed. Unlucky for Ross, that same admin was an FBI plant. Ross agrees to the plot and organizes an additional murder of another user who had been blackmailing him. The next step was to unmask the pirate, and they did this using a sophisticated search engine technique known as Googling it. They traced the first mention of the Silk Road on the normie net back to this post on theshroomery.com, posted by a user called Altoid. They search for other accounts with the same username, and they find one connected to this email address, rossalbricht at gmail.com. The feds now have his name, location, and murder messages. Now all they have to do is catch him logging into the Silk Road in the real world. It's October 2013. Ross walks from his rented home to the science fiction section of the San Francisco Public Library. He opens his laptop and logs into the Silk Road for the last time. A couple start arguing loudly in the corner. Just as Albrick turns, his laptop is swiped from under his reach, still logged in to his global drug trafficking empire. The next thing he sees is a pair of cuffs. Ross is charged with money laundering, computer hacking, conspiracy to traffic narcotics, and attempted murder of six different people. The feds declare victory by replacing the website's landing page with this message. The Silk Road is now a one-way street that leads directly to the big house. You would think that this would send the price of Bitcoin crashing, and it does. For about a week, two weeks after Ross's arrest, Bitcoin is worth a record $1,000. With drugs no longer on the menu, the only thing to do with Bitcoin is make money moves, money moves. Every other Bitcoin buccaneer encourages every other buttcoiner to hold, mine more, buy more, and inflate the price. They march on Mt. Gox and fill their sweaty hot wallets until they are fit to bursting. But as a famous poet once said, the center cannot hoddle. Hold. After all, how were these people supposed to make money if they don't eventually cash out? More and more people start to withdraw from Mark's insolvent exchange. And this is what he's always feared. Sometimes it takes people days for them to get their funds, and people all over the world start raging against their machines. They wanted their digibucks and they wanted them now. Word spreads. People start to realize something ain't kosher at Mt. Gox. On the 7th of February, 2014, the exchange halts all Bitcoin withdrawals. And then people really start to panic. How can they hoddle when they can't get hold of their Bitcoins? There are even protests outside the Mt. Gox office. Okay, well I say protests, but there was like one angry Scottish guy. But he was really angry, so Bitcoiners were not exactly the most confrontational of people. Two weeks pass, and instead of refunding any of his customers, 
Mt. Gox goes offline forever. On February 28th, Mark holds a press conference. He declares Mt. Gox is bankrupt and apologizes for losing almost 750,000 of his customers' bitcoins, which at the time would have been worth about half a billion dollars. And today, those bitcoins are worth, actually, I just did this on my calculator, this much? It's got an E in it. That not number. When you have to turn your calculator sideways to calculate how much money you owe, you've really fucked up. Mark isn't arrested until about a year later, and that's because the whole thing is such a mess of data and incompetence, the Tokyo police don't even know what to charge him with. He spends nearly a year in solitary confinement, and is eventually charged with embezzlement and the manipulation of electronic data. And he isn't convicted until 2019, and even then it's only on the second count. He serves no additional time in jail. However, during an early stage of the investigation, those 200,000 bitcoins that Mark lost are conveniently found, leading many to wonder whether Mark was holding on to them as a sort of safety net. He has to use those funds to pay back his creditors, but according to Japanese bankruptcy law, he only has to do that to the value that the coins were worth at the time of Mt. Gox's bankruptcy. And that's interesting because thanks to Bitcoin's continued price inflation, those coins are now more than enough to pay back all of his creditors. And there's enough left over that Mark will walk away from this as a multi-millionaire. Which does lead to the question, was Mark incompetent? Or was he just playing the longest game in cryptocurrency history? As you might expect, sailing wasn't quite as smooth for the Dread Pirate Roberts. Ross Ulbricht was made an example of. While the American media focused on the murder for hire charges, he's never actually convicted for any violent offence. Regardless, his trial is quick and he is sentenced to two consecutive life sentences plus 40 years just for flavour. For the last seven years, Ross has been in and out of solitary confinement, but it does look like that he's made some friends. Aww, cute. At the very least, I know that rarefied state of mind, states of pure bliss that dedicated monks experience after many years of devotion, are available to me if I live up, oh, for God's sake. There is also an enthusiastic, if deeply unconvincing movement dedicated to Ross's innocence and freedom. It ain't going well. Since the Silk Road and its captain sunk to the bottom of the deep, dark web, an armada of marketplaces have risen to take its place. The online drug trade is thriving, and it's still where the majority of Bitcoins are spent. And these marketplaces have learned from Ross's maiden voyage. They don't fly their flags quite as flagrantly. These markets change their name every few months, and they have no charismatic frontman to draw attention to them. But the spirit of the Silk Road is alive and well. Despite their many, many flaws, Mark and Ross remain Bitcoin's best poster boys. Anyone involved in that technology wants to make one of two things, money or a difference. They did both. Their actions sent shockwaves around the world, despite the fact that they were only connected to it through their desktop. Is Bitcoin the future? Probably not, but it represents the future. In the 20th century, revolutionaries wrote manifestos and ran guns. In this century, they'll be writing code and running empires from their screen-lit bedrooms.